So today I would like to introduce some concepts from probability and statistics. Um, I've said it before that sort of the main weakness of the Calculus to curriculum, in my opinion, is that it sort of gives up on trying to give applications for most of the material it presents. Like, I sort of gesture at um, trig substitution and say, this can show up when you have right triangles, but I don't actually do any applications with right triangles. And that's for time reasons. That's because if we um, are going to get through the rather significant curriculum, we have to kind of rush. But it's still unfortunate. And talking a little about probability gives us a very concrete and very easy to understand application for the integrals we've been messing around with all semester. So let's start by defining, maybe I should say defining rather informally, a random variable x. Random variables are often written with capital letters out of convention, but I'll just say x. And um, you can think of random variables as the outcome of an experiment. And for, for our purposes, this experiment is going to give numerical outcomes. And maybe I should put experiment in quotation marks because experiment can um, cover a whole host of things. So for example, I mean, you can think of kind of the traditional games you play when you're taking a probability class. You can keep flipping a coin. Let's try that again. Flipping a corn. You can keep flipping a coin until you get a heads. And your random variable could be the number of times or the number of flips, let's say, until that happens, until heads shows up. And this kind of experiment is very sort of famous you have a process, you have an idea of success and failure. Here we think of heads as a success and tails as a failure. And we want to repeat the experiment until we succeed. And we want to know how long it's going to take us to succeed. Um, here, the possible, this X variable, it can take one flip of the coin or two flips of the coin. Your X variable can be any positive integer. And I mean, it's probably pretty clear that 
that the bigger the value is, the less likely it is to be the outcome of the experiment. I mean, imagine flipping a fair coin and getting a billion tails in a row. It's not very likely, but it could theoretically happen. So a billion and one is still a valid outcome of this experiment. It's just a very unlikely. One. Then you have a lot of random variables in sort of real life. I mean, in real life, you could call almost anything a random variable. I... walk to work every day, we could define a random variable to be the time it takes me to walk to work. And you, I guess you could make a kind of philosophical argument that that isn't really a random variable because somebody is controlling it. But I mean, in practice, if you look at the time it takes me to walk to work day after day, there are going to be variations. If I'm in a... Uh, good mood, maybe I'll walk faster, or yesterday the conditions were bad, so I walked slower. So it makes sense to think of this as having some kind of randomness. And I mean, even though I, I mean, you can say, well, I'm controlling how fast I walk, but you know, from your point of view, you don't have any control over how fast I walk. So if you were trying to predict how long it would take me to come in, it would basically be a random guess. So here we have a different outcome space than here. Let's say time is being measured in minutes. There's probably some absolute minimum value. Even if I just book it as fast as I can, let's say I cannot get into work in fewer than 12 minutes. On the other hand, there's no real upper value. I mean, if I don't want to be late for class, there's an upper value, but maybe tomorrow on my walk into work, I'll get bitten by a dog and have to go um, to the doctors and it will take me, you know, I won't get into work at all that day. So, and again, this is kind of Every time infinity shows up, it's kind of an abstraction. Yes, that's eventually I will die. There are upper limits to how long anything I do can last, but we're not really interested in thinking of those. We're just um, say, well, there's no obvious upper bound, so we'll say that it's infinite. Um, similar to this, you can plug in a light bulb, and light bulbs should last for years, but we've probably all had a situation where one burns out very quickly for no clear reason. So you can let X be the number of days until the bulb 
burns out. And maybe here, I'd say that these are the possible outcomes. You know, some outcomes in this space are more likely than others. I mean, the bulb shouldn't burn out in a day. Um, something has gone very wrong if that happens. So you can say that really small numbers are unlikely. You can say that really large numbers are unlikely. But just trying to kind of abstract this, this is what I'd probably say are the possible outcomes. So this random variable and this random variable are different from this random variable. So a discrete random variable is one where you can list the possible outcomes. Well, in theory, It will often be the case that the list is infinite, so you can't really do it. So this random variable is discrete. A continuous random variable is one where I don't, this might be not quite perfectly correct, but it's close enough, is one where. The outcome space is an interval. So this is um, kind of a deep result, actually that if your outcome space is an interval, you can't list the possible outcomes, not even in an infinite list. Um, here we have an infinite number of outcomes, and here we have an infinite number of outcomes, but there's some kind of fundamental difference between them. So, that's discrete and that's continuous random variables. And in theory, if we want to talk about probabilities, discrete random variables are easy to deal with. I mean, let's say, Your experiment is to roll, roll two standard six sided die and add them together. Well, you have, as your possible outcomes, 
the numbers two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And again, at least in theory, I mean, this isn't a probability class, so we won't talk about how you do this, but you could just list the probabilities, like there is a one in 36 chance of getting a two, for example. So you can just create this table. And then if you want to know how likely is it that we'll get the seven, you go to a table and you look it up and you get your answer. Obviously, I'm making this sound easier than it is. I mean, I say you can create this table. I say that very, uh, very flippantly. If you actually try to do that, you'd find there's quite a bit of work. But you can just list your possible outcomes and say how likely each of the outcomes is. And again, to be a little less flippant, maybe, maybe the list you create is infinite and it can't actually exist on a finite sheet of paper. But with this, with continuous random variables, you can't do that. You can't create a list of possible outcomes. Um, furthermore, and this is kind of an odd result, if x is continuous, the probability of any specific outcome is zero. And this is kind of an odd Thing to think about because we have we run these experiments hundreds of times every day. When I walk to work, I'm performing an experiment. When I start to boil water to uh, make dinner, I'm performing an experiment. How long will it take the water to boil? When I give this class, I teach this class, I'm performing an experiment. It should last about 50 minutes, but maybe it will go a little short or a little long. So these experiments have outcomes, and the outcomes they have have probability zero, which probably contradicts our our intuition about, about probability. Probably where, that's not an intentional pun, we are most likely, um, we think of that if something has a probability of zero, it can't happen. But I mean, let's, um, let's take The, let's let x be the time that this lecture takes. And um, it's not totally clear what um, our probability space here is. There's, it's always kind of just taking your best guess. Um, although I guess at this point it's too late. We could imagine the lecture taking zero minutes. Again, I get bit by a dog and I don't show up. 
So the lecture never starts. Um, let's put 65 minutes, uh, not 65, that would be way over. Let's put 55 minutes as the theoretical maximum that anyone's willing to put up with me. So this is a continuous, um, continuous random variable. And let's say, you know, Let's talk about 49 minutes. And you say, well, we've had a bunch of lectures that lasted around 49 minutes. How can we say that there's a probability of zero that we get this outcome? But in reality, none of the lectures I've given have lasted 49 minutes because 49 is 49.00000 followed by an infinite string of zeros. So saying that a lecture lasts 49 minutes is an incredibly uh, strong claim. It's never happened and it never will happen that my lectures or anyone else's lectures last exactly 49 minutes. You know, we put a seven in the hundred thousandth decimal place. It's no longer 49 minutes. So even though it's not really intuitive, I mean, this lecture will end and it will have lasted however long it lasted. So that's an outcome that has probability zero and is still going to happen. But if you think of probability primarily as a tool for making predictions, this idea is going to make a lot more sense. If you're trying to predict how long this lecture lasts, not to the minute, not to the tenth of a minute, or the hundredth of a minute, or a thousandth, or the ten thousandth, or the hundred thousandths, or the billionths, but if they're trying to predict how long this lecture takes to an infinite number of decimal places, it's going to be impossible. So that's our justification for that statement. And that suggests that we need a way of talking about probability that isn't listing possible outcomes and saying how likely each of those outcomes are because um, the outcomes all have probability of zero. Even if you could create the list, it would be worthless to you. We also, um, we also want to get at the idea that in one sense, all the probabilities are equally likely, all the probabilities are zero. But in reality, I mean, if we look, if we look at this um, outcome space, I've never given a zero minute lecture, whereas I've given a bunch of lectures around 49 minutes. So all of the outcomes might be equally likely in one sense, but that's not giving you an accurate um, picture of my lectures. So, Let's try to get at the idea behind probability with continuous variables. Let's say you pick a number totally at random. 
in the interval from zero to one. So it's hard, again, it's a little hard to talk about this because all of the outcomes are equally likely. But um, let's say, what is the probability that the number we pick is less than a third. So this question's a little fuzzy because there are multiple ways we could randomly pick a number and the answer to that question is going to depend on how we pick the number. But I mean, what's, what's the answer that seems most natural? to this question. 33%. Plus 33%. 33%. I mean, if we're trying to get at the idea that all of the numbers are equally likely, and again, that's difficult to talk about because all of the numbers are always equally likely. They all have a probability of zero. But you'd say, well, This interval we're talking about takes up one third of the total space. And it therefore makes sense to say that there's a one third probability that we wind up in this interval. And let's observe, let's make the following observation that we can answer questions like this using an integral. It might seem like we're kind of taking a, a sledgehammer to a walnut to actually do that, but we can generalize this statement by saying that the probability that the number we pick is between let's say C1 and C2 is the integral from C1 to C2 of 1 dx. So here, We've got the integral from zero to one. We've got this curve up here at one. The probability that we select a number at random between C1 and C2 is this area under the curve. And this idea of probability as being area under curves generalizes really well I mean, let's say we keep this basic idea 
that we're picking a number just totally at random, but let's make the interval bigger. Instead of selecting a number between zero and one, let's select a number between zero and three. And let's ask the same question. What's the probability that we select a number less than a third? Requires a little more math, but does anybody have an answer for this? A sort of intuitive answer. One ninth. One ninth. Again, one third is one ninth of the way through the interval. So here, it's no longer going to be the integral of one. It's going to be the interval, the integral, I mean, of one third. And again, we'll talk more about why one ninth, why one, why one third. We'll talk more about this. But the probability that we select a number less than three, less than a third, sorry, is the integral of a constant. And thinking about probability as the area under a curve, again, it might seem like it's kind of overkill because, you know, we managed to answer both of these questions without resorting to integral calculus. But what this lets us do is get at the idea that some numbers might be more likely to show up than others, even though, formally speaking, all numbers are equally likely, all numbers have an outcome of zero. Let's keep the idea that probability is the area under a curve But let's say that the curve now looks like this. And you are, again, you're looking at the probability that a number you select at random falls into some interval. Well, even though, again, every specific number has an outcome of zero, by drawing, by thinking of probability as an area under a curve, we can get at the idea that some numbers are less likely than others. The probability that we select a number between C sub three and C sub four is that area. The probability that we select a number 
between C sub one and C sub two is this area. So you can see that one of those areas is much larger and a number that we select at random is more likely to be in the middle of that interval than it is to be far away. Again, what did I say when I was looking at um, the time a lecture takes? I said, let's think of this as, um, as taking values between zero and 55. Maybe we have a curve. That looks something like that. So I might be exactly as likely to take 20 minutes as I am to take 50 minutes, but the probability that I take between 20 and 25 minutes is extremely small. Whereas the probability that I take between 45 and 50 minutes is much larger. Now, if we're going to think of probability as area under a curve, we can't just use any curve. There are rules that have to be satisfied. So let's talk about, that's a fancy name, a probability density function on an interval. And tying this together with the material we talked about earlier this week and last week, um, A could be negative infinity, B could be positive infinity. So could be a finite interval, could be an infinite interval. But what does a function need to do to be a probability density function? Well, it can never be negative, because if you have a negative function, you get negative areas under the curve, and that doesn't make any sense to talk about negative probabilities. We can weaken this slightly, but... P of X should be more or less continuous. Um, I mean, I think probably when I introduced the integral for the very first time, I probably made the observation that not every function has an integral, and then we never talked about that again. But continuity is ensuring that these definite integrals exist, that these things are defined. And then, well, the probability is that we get an outcome is one. 
So if we select a number at random in the interval from A to B, the probability that we select a number from A to B is one. A very um, natural idea. So let's look at some probability density functions that start with a really ugly one that is nevertheless extremely famous. I mean, not this function itself, but sort of the class of functions that it belongs to. And tying this to what we were talking about earlier, E of x is one over the square root of two pi times e to the negative 0 0.5 of x minus three over two squared. What an unpleasant looking function. It's a sad fact, though, of probability and statistics that these very unpleasant looking functions show up all the time in applications. Let's take a look at what this thing looks like. One over the square root of two pi times e to the negative 0.5 x minus three divided by two. Aha, uh -huh. let's try that again, squared. So we get a probability distribution that looks like this. In theory, if you select a number at random, it can be anywhere on the real number line. But in reality, this curve gets very close to zero and the areas under the curve here are very close to zero. So it's very hard to randomly select numbers in this interval. Similarly, it's very hard to select numbers in this interval. So this is the famous normal distribution, which you might know um, as the bell curve. And if I mess around with, let's see, which of these numbers can I mess around with? There, if I mess around with these numbers, I can make I can move this. So here, uh, this is going to take me forever. Let me just this. So again, here's the idea that in theory, you can select anything, but in practice, only numbers around a certain region will be selected. This is when you talk, which I don't do, but when you talk about curving tests, I mean, it's done very informally. People just usually just add numbers to test scores, which is not curving tests at all, what curving tests is doing is trying to adjust the test grade so that they follow this probability distribution. You think of the test as a random experiment, 
and you think of the student scores as the values the random variable can take on, and you say, well, I think most of my students should be getting mid Cs, so I want the area under the curve here to be high, but I don't want a lot of my students to be failing, so I think the area under the curve here ought to be low. And if all of my students are getting A's, that probably means the test was too easy, so I want the area under the curve here to be low. Um, notice, as so often happens when we use pure math to try to model real-world situations, this does leave open the possibility of nonsense results. You know, if the test is graded out of 100, you know, you can say, well, it's still technically possible to get values above 100. It's still technically possible to get values below zero. But that kind of aberrant result happens so rarely that we don't worry about it. So another, what, what time do I have left? Not a huge amount. So another very famous probability distribution that I'll just put on the board and we can talk about tomorrow is a probability distribution on the interval from zero to infinity. And it looks like this. And here C is just some constant. And unlike here, where this integral is absolutely unmanageable, it's relatively straightforward to show that this is a probability distribution. We'll do it uh, tomorrow. And just sort of talking ahead a little, This is a memoryless probability distribution. It's like you're going fishing and you're asking how long it will take to catch the first fish. And what this is trying to get at, what this is getting at, is the idea that the fish don't care how long you've been fishing. A fish is exactly as likely to bite during the fourth hour as it is during the third hour as it is during the first hour. So this is the probability distribution. Again, it's called memory this because the fish don't remember that you've been fishing for three hours already that gets at this. It's also probably the probability distribution we use in our light bulb example. The light bulb doesn't remember that it's been burning. It just burns until it burns out. More on this tomorrow. See you then.